I'm Jim Minnell, and I'm an editor of Brick Journal, and I'm also a uh, uh, Lego fan, as everybody else is, and I'm also a uh, Disney fan. And recently, in the past few years, I've started building Disney stuff and started looking for Disney mocks. This presentation is about some of the uh, things, very few, it's actually a, a thumbnail of what I've found so far. What we're going to have is a, is a very quick uh, uh, view of what, what's going on with the environment, but there's a, going to be two other panelists here. Uh, one of them is John Rudy, and the other one is Bill Volverick. And uh, they are also Disney builders of different types. So right now I'm just going to start off by going into the presentation and showing you some quick uh, other builds, such as the one done by uh, Steve Walker. Steve Walker, if you didn't know, he's running this gig. And um, some years ago, he actually had a setup for Town Square. Uh, for Disneyland. Uh, and it was large enough such that it was mini fixed scale. And also what was cool about it was that I was able to actually recognize where I stood when the flags went down every day. So I was very impressed and very happy with this. On the other hand, if you go overseas, you can go over to France and see a build by, a, a, by a Gioma Rousseau. He only did part of this. Um, I mean, actually, we're only seeing part of uh, Disneyland Paris. He's working on uh, making the entire park. And uh, he just finished uh, Big Thunder Mountain. So if you go over to Facebook and go to Disney Bricks uh, on uh, Facebook, you can see him working on the park and, uh, and taking care of things. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, he's added a whole bunch in, in the past, uh, thanks to the pandemic, he's added a whole bunch to the layout. It also has uh, the French um, Disneyland Paris uh, Space Mountain layout, which is much different than, uh, than the American layout. Now over here, we have another attendee to, to BrickCon up top, Ben Harpel. Uh, <laughs> and uh, also we have a couple of other builds of some vignettes from the Haunted uh, Mansion and um, Pirates of the Caribbean. And on the bottom is a mini, mini fixed scale version of Space Mountain built by Scott Little, built more than a few years ago for the NMRA um, uh, convention, which was held in Anaheim that year. That was about five years ago. And for the last of the thumbnails, this is a build by Mike Neves, who is, um, he's actually a master builder at one of the uh, Discovery Centers. Uh, and um, this, is a, this is, of course, a Sleeping Beauty as, as Briar Rose. And uh, what's really cool about this is that he's, a, he's one of the few people that will play out of scale to make figures. And um, from experience, when, from what I'm going to show you, I, I can tell you that is a real pain in the rear to do. So that's a quick overview of, um, of the uh, hobby. But now I'm going to talk about the stuff that I build. I build stuff along, this, along the line of what Mike does. And what, what I'm going to call my section is building characters. Now building characters, the problem with this is that the scale is not the normal scale. This is not minifig scale, it's actually bigger. The great thing is, is that you can put more details in. The bad thing is, is that everything is harder to build. So when you start out, Disney always likes to build things with rounded, rounded shapes. And that is aggravating to do. But I started off with this guy. And yes, he has more than a few joints. If you take a look, there's um, joints of every type, including what would be called illegal joints, the single stud joints. If you take a look at his shoulders, they rotate because there's one stud holding the arm piece in. That's good and bad. Now, from there, I went to, went to Mini. Mini is not too different from Mickey, just like in real life. Uh, there are different uh, drawing, drawing uh, uh, elements, but generally the same thing. And if you take a look at her heels, there's a lot of goofy stuff going on. I like the pun there, Joe. A lot of goofy stuff going on. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Next one is 
Donald, he's a tough one because if you take a look, his head is big and it's all riding on the ball joint. And yes, the ball joints do wear out and yes, I have to switch them out after every so often. But once again, his arms also are using a single stud <coughs> joint. And now we change the model a little bit and we go with Goofy. Goofy is a completely different uh, build because he's tall. Um, if you take a look at his neck, he, has a, he still has the old clip. I, used, I started out all my buildings using um, uh, clips. And uh, when the ball joints came in, which tells you how long I've been building, I started replacing all the necks with ball joints because the ball joints let you tilt heads. And then after that, Pluto. Pluto actually was an easier build because of his legs. Once I figured out the legs, the rest just sort of fell into place. And this head is not too different from Goofy, just like the real thing. And after that, we have a variant. This is the one I went through all, this is the one I really worked to, to make. Brave Little Taylor is my favorite character and to make him was a real fun thing. But what's really nifty is that very recently, this is, I was able to build his companion. Princess Minnie, thanks to the pink. So, whoops, that shouldn't be there. So, that's all for me. Next up, Hey, Joe, uh, just one question. What's your shoot. opinion of the new Mickey and Minnie set? I, schizophrenic, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I think it's a real good thing that they put out a set. It's taken long enough, but uh, their rendition is actually one that's more of the modern Mickey, uh, which is the modern uh, anime-based one that's out now. I'm not too terribly fond of that version. So schizophrenic that and the uh, actual model which i don't have uh the actual model is more of a statue uh so they're they're pretty there's very little flexibility and posability on this so um but uh, yeah uh, that that's my take on it um hi my name's john uh i'm in pennsylvania so beaming across the country um really excited to be here and joe builds characters I aim for the Disney parks, um, particularly Disneyland. I'm a historian. I like history geek stuff. And so I geek out about, um, well, frankly, all of the ride vehicles, all of the small details. And for me, Imagineering, and those are the people that make the Disney places, uh, Imagineering is all about those small details and looking at the small things. And I figured out that when you use that mantra, look at the small details, it can really take you to really cool places when you're replicating Disney ride vehicles. And that's what I want to talk about. I build in a couple different scales, but my favorite scale is minifig scale. And one of the things that really bugs me is on model versus off model. You know, we had that great question in the chat about what do you think of the, the Mickey, the Mickey set. And um, one of the things that bothers me about it, it's actually off model. And that's a, an animation term. And what it means is that it doesn't match what it should look like. So there is a standard Mickey and the Mickey in the set doesn't meet the standard Mickey. It has an eight stud wide ears. And if you run the numbers, his ears should actually be six studs wide. Um, really bugs me. So when stuff isn't on model, um, I, it starts to, to really grind my gears. 
And that means for me, one part can dictate everything. I can literally find one part and that I go, that's the perfect part for this specific tiny little detail. And that dictates the whole build. That dictates the scale, that dictates the color, that dictates the size, that dictates everything. So I wanna take you through how a couple different parts have done that for me. And the first ride I wanna start with you on is this one right here. The fly, Dumbo the Flying Elephant. It was a 1955 initial attraction. It didn't open on opening day in Disneyland, but it opened a few days later. Um, Dumbo the Flying Elephant has this, it's a character, right? It's, it, it has curves, it has lines. And it took me a while, I was, I played back and forth on how to build this. And then I realized Dumbo has a forehead you could land a 747 on. I mean, look at those foreheads right there, right? It's huge. And I was, okay, what, what do I do with this? How do I, how do you, how do you render that? And so here's my Dumbo. This is my Dumbo. And it took a lot of iterations of this. And I didn't keep those iterations. Sorry, I didn't plan for this when I was building Dumbo a few years ago. But that Dumbo right there, see that giant forehead? Suddenly it reads. And then you add in the eyes, you add in the shapes, and that build is extremely complex. The face is snot, snot in uh, four different directions. Uh, I had to use a, a um, clutch gear there for the, for the frill around, uh, around Dumbo's neck. So it's using parts off, off license, but you notice that one crucial part right there in the center is that one by two arch brick. That right there holds everything together because without Dumbo's giant arching forehead, it's not Dumbo. So the next thing that I stumble on constantly is minifigures are weird. I know for all of the geeks out there, you know this, minifigs are weird. They don't work. They aren't like scale miniatures. So they're either, either too short for how wide they are or too wide for how short they are. I'm not sure which it is and we can argue about it, but one of the hallmarks of all of my Disney ride vehicles is I want them to fit a fig. Um, uh, Mark Sandlin and, uh, and uh, uh, Chris Giddens on their, on their stream they're doing on YouTube now um, are talking about um, playability playability, that has playability. And for me, the ride vehicle should have playability. You should be able to put a fig in there and go, yes, Mickey is riding this, or Minnie is riding this, or my sig fig is riding this. And this ride vehicle in particular for what Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, another 1955 original from Disneyland, is a pain. Um, if you've ever ridden this, you are outrageously lucky. It's an amazing ride. Um, if you ever tried to ride it with two adults, in that car, it is a beast because that car is so narrow and you're just crammed in there. So how do you cram a minifig into a seat? And particularly, how do you fit two of them side by side, which is how that vehicle works? Here's what I came up with. I crammed Mickey in by having his butt hang over the side. Um, this is my Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, ride vehicle. Um, and again, this is all dictated by one tiny thing, one tiny thing, and it's a stupid part. It's a part that I use all the time. I just had the, the bin of them here. These right here, one by two jumper, jumper plates. One by two jumper plates. They are so useful, and they are the key to this design, and they set the entire scale. Because once I know that Mickey is going to be sitting with his right butt on a jumper plate and his left hanging over the edge, suddenly the scale starts to fall together. And then I look through the Bricklink catalog and I can find that those fenders exist. And when I got those fenders, then I know the wheel size and on and on and on, just cascades forward. Yeah, Mickey's showing you exactly the problem right there. And there's what he's sitting on. Two jumper plates right next to each other with a tile. And you can fit two figures in this. Now, one of them has to have their arm up and one has to have their arm down, but I'm happy with that. <laughs> it's at least still playable. Dumbo showed us that curves are hard. And curves are very hard because we have a limited catalog of what's available. I have wanted forever, and Joe will tell you this, that we, we talk back and forth about our favorite rides. And this is one of his favorite rides. This is one of my favorite rides because it's so kinetic. The Mad Tea Party, the teacups, they spin on so many different axes. Like you sit in them, they spin, and they spin around, and they spin around again. I love this ride, but Look at those curves. 
everything. There's not a straight line on them. Everything is movement and circles. And Joe was saying, you can't do that in Lego. It doesn't work. So you have to start looking for curves that work. You go through the Brooklyn catalog, you find this curve doesn't work. No, this curve's too big. This curve's too small. This one might. And that's what dictates the size and scale. And here's my teacup. So this teacup is all dictated by that one by three curve on the top. That one by three arch brick right there, everything else falls together because of that. Because of the size of that, then that dictates the size of the cup, but it also dictates the size of the saucer underneath. This can get you into really, really tough spots because until a, a year or two ago, um, that three by three plate with the curve on the edge, um, that was outrageously expensive, especially in blue. Um, it's limited to a couple sets and it just came out in, in one of the um, vehicle sets a year or two ago um, that actually brought the price down. But this is one of the dangers of building like this. If you build like this, you paint yourself into a corner and you start finding that, oh, that's the perfect part and it costs $10 a piece. So there you can see the parts that help dictate this. You have those arches, they move to that arch you see on the right hand side there. And then finally, the teacup handle actually is the glue that holds the whole thing together with that lamp holder. Sometimes you just see a part and you go, that part, I need to build this thing for that part. I need to build with that specific part. And for me, that happened with this thing right here, the Jungle Cruise one of my favorite rides in all the Disney parks because it's corny and it has dad jokes in it constantly. And I saw this mock on Flickr by Brick Simsey from 2016. And it's a, a, a uh, narrow gauge railway. I've been trying to figure out how to do a narrow gauge railway for Disney stuff. I saw this mock and particularly I saw, look at the engine on the left. Look at that smokestack. I went, oh my God. That snake is perfect. I need to make a jungle cruise. That snake looks like the smoke coming out of a, a smokestack. And I was like, oh, NPU, nice part use. That's great, I'm going there. So I got myself a snake in Bricklink and started pulling parts together. And that actually dictated a new scale for me. I usually build minifig scale. I moved to this. It's not quite micro scale. It's not quite minifig scale. I'm going with that Star Wars scale that Lego came out with a few years ago, MIDI scale. Uh, and this is my MIDI scale Jungle Cruise boat. You can see that, that swooping smoke inspired the whole scale, inspired the whole thing. I'm really happy with how this came out. It's three studs wide on the bottom, splays out to four studs wide in the middle. And there you go, there's some of the parts that make it possible. You've got the snake there in the center, which then dictated how I connect the snake, which is that bar holder there. And that also helped me to realize at that scale, I can do the striping on that canopy, blue, white, blue, white, blue, white, plates and jumper plates alone. And of course, I love that little one by one arch, that new piece there that helps me make the boiler too. One part can solve your problem. And that's the cool thing about building small. Mark Twain said, um, I would have written you a shorter letter if I had more time. And this is one of those cases where if you find the right thing, it can help you write the short letter. So if you wanna see more of my builds, you can go to Flickr. My, I'm on Flickr is TJJohn12. Um, find my whole back catalog over there. Hi everybody, I am Bill Valbrecht. I am a former, uh, model builder at Legoland California and then I became the art director and eventually creative director for Legoland Parks uh, worldwide new development so I actually was um, the lead designer for Legoland Florida, Legoland Malaysia, Legoland Dubai, Legoland Japan I don't think I'm forgetting one in there somewhere but anyway so I've done theme park design for many many years uh, I left the company a few years ago. Uh, I've done a few projects since then for other parks. Uh, unfortunately, I've not been invited to work for Disney yet. So, of course, that's on my bucket list. 
Um, but right now I'm doing freelance work, uh, focusing on art, uh, some theme park designs, uh, but a lot of Lego still, of course, because, you know, Lego is in my DNA and I, I love the stuff. So there's always a nice way to kind of combine my, my two great loves, which is Lego and Disney parks. Um, I'm California, so uh, Disneyland is where it's at. You know, Disneyland, Florida, you know, all those parks are great and beautiful in their own way, but I, I love the nostalgia of the original parks. Now, as far as what I build when it comes to Disney, I don't really have a particular style or, you know, uh, uh, I'm all over the place with what I build. You know, whatever strikes my fancy, that's what I build. So I don't like, you know, it's not minifigure scale, it's not giant scale, it's not mini land scale. It's, it really is a lot of different things going on. Um, but one of the first things we learn as a model builder at the parks is how to build a round rolling ball to make a sphere. So this is how we do a lot of our sculptural models. Nowadays, it's all done on computers. They have a nice fancy computer program. If you design it in 3D modeling program, then you kind of import it into a, a program, which then kind of digitizes it into a you know, pixelated brick pattern. Uh, but but my, my, I'm old school and uh, give me a pile of bricks and uh, I can pretty much you know, cobble something together that's there. So like I said, we start with a ball. It kind of unlocks a lot of the three-dimensional thinking you have to kind of do to make sculptural models. And that leads to my first Disney model, which is the mouse himself, Mickey. And if you can see the ball, you can kind of see how that, that training really works well to create his head. It, Mickey's head is almost a perfectly round sphere, say for his ears and his nose and his mouth coming out. Uh, this is a model I did many years ago, probably almost 15 years ago now. Uh, actually, I think I displayed it at BrickCon uh, in Seattle, I think in 2007, 2008, perhaps. Uh, so it's been kicking around for a little while. Um, I did do a recent update to it because uh, we had some new parts that we didn't have before. So I was able to uh, rebuild his eyes to give that pie-eyed classic Mickey look. Uh, and then, of course, after 15 years of any Lego model with white bricks, they do have a tendency to yellow. So I actually rebuilt his hands and his face to kind of clean him up a little bit. And, you know, it's a real fun model. You know, I, I really do enjoy it. Um, you know, it started out as a small little figurine I had found at a, um, a Disney store. And a really great fun pose. So I thought, well, that's something kind of cool I can try out. And, you know, so I used that as my maquette and built it up and kind of created them. And, you know, it's a, it's a cool model. You know, 15 years on and he's still standing. There are some stability issues just because he is so top heavy with his giant melon. Um, but uh, like I said, he's, he, he hasn't fallen over and broken yet, knock on wood. So that actually leads to after 15 years of being lonely and being sad, uh, Mickey needed a friend. So this is actually a premiere model, never been seen before anywhere because I just finished it last week. Um, we now have a mini mouse to go with it. Uh, so that is the now companion piece for Mickey. And again, it's in that kind of 1920s, 1930s style, um, really based around their, you know, the very first Disney talking Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Willie. Um, so, you know, she's got her little daisy in her hat. She's got her little half polka dot dress. Um, you know, her, her nice, big, clunky, high heel shoes. And, um, you know, it, it's a lot of the model is the same as far as the head, because Mickey and Minnie are nearly identical. But she gets some uh, shaded eye, uh, eyebrows, uh, eyebrows, eyelids, um, some long lashes. And uh, other than that, her hat and her dress, but the one thing that really sets her apart from uh, Mickey. So finally got them together in the same room. There they are. Looking very happy to finally have a girlfriend. So he's, he's uh, like, yay, give me a hug. Or, you know, platonic friendship, that's fine too. Um, the, the skirt on Minnie was really challenging because when you do sculptural models, to try and get pattern and shape at the same time is super complex. So I actually did a prototype of the skirt in, in Lego blue and then once I got that kind of ruffled, complicated pattern of the, the shape of it down, then I actually kind of cheated and got my Sharpie marker and drew the polka dots where I thought they'd go. And then when I did the final uh, built version, I built it in the proper colors so you can kind of see, you know, how the polka dots go. You know, they are kind of funny looking at a couple different angles, but if you, you know, turn it around, it, it, it does work in a certain way. And then uh, I also decided to put these together with uh, another model I did a couple of years ago. This was uh, 
a cake I had built to celebrate Mickey's 90th birthday. And I kind of wanted it to be in that wacky Disney style, you know, maybe like Goofy was the baker. And so it was a little lopsided and, you know, frosting dripping all over the place. And uh, it was just kind of a, you know, a big, big mess. But, uh, you know, Mickey and Minnie are very happy to, you know, dive in and have some cake. So I've up I updated the numbers. So instead of the 90th birthday this year, I think November 18th is Mickey's birthday, which everyone makes a big deal about Mickey's birthday being on, uh, you know, November 18th. But they premiered on the same cartoon at the same time, both Minnie and Mickey. So it's really her birthday, too. So they're uh, November 18th. They'll be turning 92 years old, according to the official uh, word from Disney. So that's kind of the sculptural stuff. You know, pretty cool models. I'm gonna keep them together because I just think they turn out cool and they're fun. Um, but I also do other styles of building, and this is kind of a sort of a premiere of a model. Not really. I had it at Bricks LA last uh, January, but um, it wasn't quite finished. I, I really rushed it, so I finally got it on a base and expanded it and made it a little bigger. And uh, I'll give you a hint of what it is. I want to, you know, it's it's the ride that you either love or you hate. Uh, Personally, I love this ride. Um, it's just so charming and optimistic and happy, which are none of the things I am in real life. So that's why it's a, you know, a nice change of pace. But um, the, the, the design for the It's a Small World ride, this is the one in California. It was started out in 1964 at the New York World's Fair. And it was sponsored by Pepsi Cola. And it was the ride as we know it, except for it didn't have this facade. It was um, a very kind of plain, mid-century modern facade. They had this beautiful thing called the Tower of the Four Winds, which was kind of the thing to draw people towards the ride back in the day. Uh, unfortunately, when the World's Fair ended, they just bulldozed this beautiful Tower of the Four Winds and dumped it into the Hudson River, where it still lies today. Um, but this facade then was created, because you know Walt Disney, he was a smart businessman. He, said, well, okay, I'll, I'll design this ride for you guys, but when the World's Fair is done, I get it, bring it back to California. So he always had the intentions to create it as an attraction for, for Disneyland Park. Um, but since he didn't have the Tower of the Four Winds and he didn't have the building it went in, he uh, relied on one of the greatest Disney Imagineers of all time, Mary Blair, uh, to design the facade. Uh, she was also key in designing a lot of the, uh, well, pretty much the look and feel of the ride on the inside with the, the brilliant geometric shapes, the really bright colors. Um, yeah, it just visually, it's, it's a stunning, stunning ride, even you know with the song. Um, so the reason why I always kind of had in the back of my mind that this is something I might want to build in Lego was as a kid, I never went to Disneyland, but somehow we had a Disney souvenir guidebook. And the guidebook had a picture of this. And I was just as three or four years old, fascinated by it. And the first thing I ever remember drawing as a kid, or at least attempting to draw, was this facade. So, you know, many, 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 many years later, you know, I finally was able to realize a dream of creating a Lego. So this is the, it's a small world in Lego. Um, it's about, maybe about 50% larger than it was at Bricks LA. I had to expand it, I had to raise it up, because at some point, not, it's not still not done. I'm at 90% right now. It's going to have um, the the canal for the boats. Um, you can kind of see on the the raised platform. There's some roller coaster track, the, the great new roller coaster track from Lego. Um, it's going to be motorized. I'm going to have the doors open, and then every quarter of the hour at Disneyland, the whole clock tower opens up, all the doors open, and these these dolls go on a track in and out of the the clock tower. Uh, dolls of the world. So I'm going to actually be using minifigures, um, using a lot of the collectible minifigures that they've released over the last few years to kind of recreate some of these and maybe cobble together some Frankenstein monsters of uh, my own to fill in the gaps that they don't have. Um, so yeah, there's gonna be a lot of motors, things like the clock face will rock back and forth, the little propellers will spin. So there'll be a lot going on. And uh, thank you to Lego and Disney for releasing the uh, Disneyland train. So I can uh, finally add that to the scene. Uh, you know, I was able to push it back and add the train tracks to it. I still have a couple towers I need to add um, behind the main clock tower. There's like a windmill, there's a pagoda, and I think the Eiffel Tower. Uh, so those all have to be added. So I'll be doing that in a couple of weeks and then finally posting this online. But just in case anyone's interested, here's a little more of a close up on the clock tower. The face was super tricky to do for the clock face. Um, 
you know, now that they have that beautiful eight by eight round plate, I think actually using the four quarter rounds, um, you know, that kind of dictated the scale of everything because that's as small as I could make the face and get any decent detail to it. So that kind of started out and then everything kind of built up organically around it. I don't really plan on models, you know, just give me a pile of bricks and I'll eventually figure it out and look at my computer screen once in a while for reference photos. Uh, another thing that was pretty challenging was on the side of the doors, you see some numbers. There's a zero, nine, a one, eight, seven, six, and four. They actually have all 10 numbers, but for the life of me at the scale, I could not figure out how to do a five and a two and a three. So they are just going to be skipped. Um, maybe someday I'll get to it. But uh, another big thing that was a super big challenge for this model, there's a side view from the left side, was gold. Lego's been great about releasing a lot of cool gold pieces uh, uh, recently, but there's still not a huge palette of bricks to choose from. So really trying to create these very specific shapes and patterns with a very limited palette of bricks, I really had to kind of dig through my archives to kind of make things work. Um, for the most part, I think it turned out successfully. I feel it didn't look too bad. Um, some parts I got through uh, parts drafts from my local lug, sand lug. Other ones I've had to go through BrickLink and pay a lot of money for. Uh, but I think the overall effect is uh, it was worth it. And here's from the other side, the train going through. Uh, I'm tricking you guys a little bit. I don't have the full train because I need to add about three or four more passenger cars for it to fit. So, uh, you know, you just push it to the side a little bit and the other side and no one knows the difference. Um, you can also see down below at the bottom of the screen, that's the entrance for the boats to go into. So at some point, the, the, the canal the boats sit in will be expanded and curved around and I'll build some boats. Uh, might need John to help me to figure out the, the scale for the ride vehicle because Lord knows I don't do small scale stuff that much. There's a little detail of the clock face. And uh, if you have the song stuck in your head now, I'm so sorry, I, I do apologize. And then here's a, a nice little final shot of the, the train passing by. So there you go. That's about all I've done for now. I have a few more Disney models. You know, of course, you know, my to-do list is always ex ever expanding and growing. I think one of the next ones I want to try and do is the uh, three hitchhiking ghosts from the, the uh, Haunted Mansion, because that's just such a great, great ride. Also, maybe do some uh, Enchanted Tiki Room stuff, since that's my most favorite part of the whole park. But, uh, you know, there you go. That's what I got. I get So that's pretty much it, guys. Now, uh, now we have a question and answer. So, so start shooting. I may have a solution for you already. Woohoo! Um, Love it. Small world uh, vehicles. So we'll have to talk. I, I was just going to stick some uh, Lego chairs on a on a boat hull and see if it worked, but that that's much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> it might fit. Oh, that's a good question. Somebody asked. Uh, Lin Wang asked. Uh, Does anyone know whether Lego might in the future release some other attraction sets? I I couldn't tell you. So I, I will say that um, Lego Ideas is not the way to do it. Yeah. Um, currently, you cannot submit anything that is Disney Parks related um, to Lego Ideas. And that also tells me a little bit of maybe they do expect in the future to keep releasing those types of sets. But I do know that currently that is a barred IP license. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> the idea, oh, well, and you just answered the next question on the chat, so you must be reading. Uh, <laughs> oh, Bill, you have a question. I do. I, I'm, 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 back, I'm checking out the back chats, so I haven't quite got there. What's the question? Question for Bill. The Walt Disney Family Museum recently had a call for public submissions about Small World. Did I have to submit yours? No, I didn't because I just finished this two hours ago. So... <laughs> <laughs> But it, okay. if they're still open to submissions, I, I'd be happy to submit it. Uh, that's on my bucket list to go up to the Family Museum up in San Francisco. I, I hear it's a fantastic experience. So, so John, what what's your um what's your dream uh, uh, mock? My dream mock um, right now it is the um, haunted mansion in Disneyland. So. I've built a, uh, a large a minifig scale uh, Haunted Mansion for Walt Disney World, as well as uh, a Hollywood or a, a um, California Adventure Tower of Terror. Um, and I really would like to get a uh, oh, Disneyland Haunted Mansion, but my design uses, 
this is one of those, the perfect part is often too expensive. It uses one by one round uh, bricks and plates in sand green, which have not been available since the first year that Harry Potter was initially released with the yellow faced minifigures. Um, and there were only like two in two or three of the sets. And, you know, having seven gazillion of those, Bill, are you gonna make me angry? Bill, are you, wait, you have to speak, speak, speak Bill, so, so I can see your camera big. Yeah, I can't see it without me speaking. I'm just showing my uh, a small handful. You said one by one plate? Oh, no, no, I, plate, plate's fine. This is round. Oh, round, I have some of those too. Yeah. And round plates, yeah. And, and green is one of my big, big, big favorite colors, so I have more than I need. But I saw your comment above about needing gold plate, so I do actually have a lot of that too. Cool. So we'll talk afterwards. So, so right now on, on my list, Joe, that's that's the highest. But also, I would love to do a Florida Tower Terror too. That's someday in the future. That that's a big one. Hey, Joe, we had a question. If uh, you could share your drawing desk. Oh man. Um. You got, a, you got a handy. Yeah, it's in. Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, it's packed away. That's the problem. This is packed away. I hadn't anticipated using that because, for all that it is, it's a it's a square. Mm. It's literally a square, uh, a square with a whole bunch of little square drawers. Which, in terms of building, it's a nice show show of tan bricks. But outside of that, it's. Is definitely a case of where the environment matters more than the actual build, and um, so I don't, I don't have any photos of it. Uh, they're deep in my hard drive, but uh, it's like <laughs> right now, it's like I can't, I can't see you looking for them. So sorry, Joe Ashley here. I also had a question for you guys about licensing overall for all of you, you Bill and others like. You know, what kind, you know, the, the mouse is, the mouse, to say with air quotes, is fairly aggressive in pursuit of, you know, please don't make any money off of our mm -hmm. IP, et cetera. I was just wanted to get you guys friendly perspective on, you know, caution and conservatism in the builds, et cetera. Um, well, I, I can maybe speak a little bit about that, you know, since I used to work for Legoland Parks and, you know, I know how parks are about, you know, intellectual property. Of course, Legoland's not quite as um, aggressive as Disney. Um, I, I think as a fan model, you can create whatever you want. I think when you try to monetize it somehow is when they have a problem. Um, so to build a model, to display a model, to put pictures online, mm -hmm. that's one thing. You can create instructions and give them away for free. But the moment you try to say charge for those instructions or you know, make a model and let someone buy it from you. You know, I mean, you can always do things, I guess, you know, secretly and hope for the best. But, you know, I've heard way too many stories of uh, Disney lawyers getting very aggressive over some of the most minor things you ever hear. And, you know, I mean, I, and I love the Disney brand. You know, I mean, I get it. They have to protect their property the same way Lego protects their license and their trademarks with their bricks. Um, you know, it's their, their brand and they have to be you know, very cautious. On the flip side of that coin, though, um when you go to someplace like Etsy or Tee Public or any of those sites, I mean, it's a dime a dozen to find Disney designs that are that are getting out there and being monetized. Mm -hmm. So I also think that there's there's not enough lawyer hours in the heat to, between now and the heat death of the universe um, to really <laughs> tackle to tackle what they need to. And I think they're going after bigger fish than smaller fish. But that's just I am not a lawyer, <laughs> but that's that's how I'm viewing it too. Well, it's bigger, smith, uh, bigger fish and uh, meaner fish. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if you're not doing something that's um, negative toward, toward Disney, there's a given implication that, yeah, it's okay. There's really no definite thing out there. I've worked, with Disney, I've worked uh, at, at the Disney parks and yes, they are very, very protective of the brand and uh, for good reason. Uh, but at the same time, as John says, there's a whole bunch going on and there's a whole bunch of people who build stuff. And so if you poke around, you can find, find uh, Disney art and Disney shirts or whatever. Not very many Disney um, uh, sets though, <laughs> because I've looked a couple of times and I, I've not seen anything. So. I think 
it's it's very similar to the um, Le Pen Lego controversy too. You know, there there you have an organization that is explicitly cutting into Lego's bottom line um, mm-hmm. by making a clone set. Whereas you've got some other some of the other kind of third party brick manufacturers, um, brick brick arms, uh, probably the biggest one, but then the other ones as well. Um, they're technically doing the same thing Le Pin is doing, uh, making bricks that aren't made by Lego, but they're doing it on a smaller scale. They're not cutting into the bottom line. They're, they're filling in niches of the market. And so Lego's not going after them. Well, it should be pointed out also um, that um, Disneyland Tokyo had a, um, had a vendor who produced block sets. And some of those block sets actually showed up at Disney World for about six months. Um, in terms of building, they were, yes, they were, (laughs) yes, they were. But at the time they were the only, only way you can get something that resembled a Mickey minifigure and, um, Mickey, Minnie, Donald, maybe Daisy, but, um, but then Disney, um, once Disney partnered with Lego, they basically disappeared overnight. So that was, a, that was a good question that actually was in the chat, Joe, was um, do we have a favorite Disney collectible minifig? And then what is it? And then this, do we have a dream fig? And you know, I, I fall back on Mickey. Um, it was a dream to get Mickey. And so as soon as we had the red shorts, Bill's, Bill's Mickey um, that, that's right there over his shoulder, <laughs> minifig form, I freaked out. Um, and having Steamboat Willie on top of that was, was even more of a freak out. <sighs> um, oh, no. I, I would love to have, I don't, I don't have the Disney train set yet. I, I have hacked together my own version of it. Um, and Goofy is still a dream figure of mine. Um, so getting more Goofies out there on the market would be so beautiful, um, whether they're through collectible figures or something else like that. It'd be so exciting. Uh, Nicholas, I'm putting a link in the chat while the other guys talk about their figures. Well, my favorite minifigure would be hands down Brave Little Taylor. That's the one I want. Ooh. And... Um, uh, because it's such a simple, simple thing, and uh, it's just just a gorgeous little thing that would translate immensely well. Um, currently, my favorite—I don't think I have one. They're all—they have a uniformity that I really like, and so I can't really single out a, a, a particular minifig. Um, I, I, the only one that really comes to mind is Buzz Lightyear, because he's such a differently. Uh, built a character. So your turn, Bill. Mm. Um, well, my favorite one that they've done so far, I like the genie. You know, the genie is a great character from, you know, one of the best movies, yeah. uh, Aladdin. Um, you know, they did everything about so many different unique parts to it that just really, really sold the, the figure. As for the figures I'd like to see, I mean, obviously a Goofy would be great. So you don't have to spend, you know, $300 to get one because I have a friend who really, really wants one and yeah. he wants mine and I'm not going to give it to him. Uh, sorry, Bob. <laughs> Um, so that'd be kind of cool, but I think like a Walt Disney figure would be really awesome, you know, you know, you actually get the man himself. Um, I think, I don't know if there's one yet or about, I, I don't think there is, but, uh, I think Lilo would be great to go with Stitch because I think of the, the modern era Disney movies, Lilo and Stitch is one of my most favorite. Like it's, it's such a beautifully done film, like artistically. So I think to have that character go with Stitch would be really awesome. I think I really, I really appreciated the fact that we got the um, real minifigures of Anna and Elsa, and I would love to see some more real minifigures of other Disney princesses too. That would be a nice, a nice fill in. Um, I love the Friends figures; they're great, but they're great for what they are. Um, and so, getting getting the minifigs that I could have stand alongside my other minifigs to kind of make a park vignette or something like that. Question is: Did you have to ask permission to publish Disney characters in Brick Journal? No. Because it's editorial, right? Yeah, it's art. It's, for lack of a better term, it's art. Yeah. Now, if I tried to sell that particular sculpture, that's a whole different game. Right. So, guess that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much.